because McVeigh had known him and trusted him, and they shared, definitely shared, a very strong anti-government sentiment. Murder. The unlawful killing of another living, breathing human being. Or, as was the case on April 19, 1995, on a cool, crisp spring morning in downtown Oklahoma City, 168 living, breathing human beings. On this season of A Murderous Design, we'll study what may be the largest circumstantial evidence trial ever heard in an American courtroom, the United States of America versus Timothy James McVeigh. Based on the authentic trial transcripts and interviews with those who tried the case, we will uncover the author responsible for the formation and execution of A Murderous Design. I'm Brandon Birmingham. This is Timothy James McVeigh versus the USA. So in Michigan, for example, where Nichols uh, had had come from, uh, we seized the river's calling card. That was where we found um, what became uh, the means and method to explain to the jury where these two people were in the course of a year and a half of putting together um, both their plan and the components necessary to to, uh, execute it. God bless uh, Fred Dexter, who uh, made it simple for me and then later for a jury, but very, very technical, um, just to give reliability to what uh, ultimately we're trying to prove, and that is these are phone numbers that help us tell who was where uh, on certain key events. Uh, He was, um, at the end of the day, uh, an immensely important witness for the prosecution. You must have been wondering how investigators developed all those leads into the origin of the bomb components. How did they know to call Glenn Tipton at VP Racing, for example, or Linda Jewell at Mid-America Chemical? Backtracking from a little card Agent Thomas found in a stack of papers in Terry Nichols' living room. You may recall that William Sweet was the circulations manager at Liberty Lobby, the publisher of the conservative newspaper called Spotlight we talked about earlier. The paper offered a prepaid debit calling card. If purchased, customers could use it to make phone calls, whether local or long distance. All they needed was a dial tone from any phone. The customer would dial a 1-800 number, enter their account PIN number, and then dial the destination number. They could replenish the funds for the account by check or money order. One Spotlight account in particular was opened on November 12, 1993 in the name of Daryl Bridges. Address listed, 3616 North Van Dyke Road, Decker, Michigan. It was accompanied by a money order for $50 and bore the signature of Daryl Bridges. Between the time the account was created and April of 1995, the account was recharged with money numerous times. By using the dates of these, quote, recharges... September the 29th of 94, January the 21st of 95, and Valentine's Day of 95, prosecutors proved that the calling card was being used and replenished during the period of time that the components for the bomb were being procured and storage units rented. Jurors heard testimony from 27 witnesses the morning of May 7th of 1997. These types of witnesses are sometimes referred to as predicate witnesses. They were all record keepers for various phone companies like Southwestern Bell, or they worked at various places like Newton Hobby Center, VP Racing Fuels, Hutchison Raceway Park, or Paulson's Military Supply. You might remember that name from the card. All morning long, these 27 witnesses testified to jurors about certain records from their respective companies that eventually filled up two full binders, and these were the condensed records. One by one, they told jurors their phone numbers at certain times and dates beginning in 94, all the way up until April the 19th of 95. Here are some of the numbers. Vulcan Chemicals, Barton Solvents, Mid-America Chemical, Mid-Con Plastics, Harcross Chemicals, Hobby and Model Construction Supplies, Ebersol Hobby, RC Raceway, Wichita International Raceway, Heavy Demolition, Cornejo and Sons Demos. Investigators determined that all of these numbers shared something very interesting in common. By comparing these numbers to the yellow pages available to the public in Wichita, Kansas, they were all listed under the headings chemicals, barrels and drums, and racetracks. 
Now, the argument between the lawyers about these calls, of course, was that no matter how many phone records were introduced, the numbers didn't prove the identity of the caller. We know that the calls were made by someone who knew or had access to the PIN number for the calling card and the originating numbers, but the actual identity of the participants in these calls remained beyond observation. As McVeigh's lead of counsel, Mr. Stephen Jones, put it during his closing argument, the calling card didn't have a camera on it, folks. Well, while the card might not have had a camera, prosecutors believe circumstances within the call records and surrounding the card could identify the callers. Starting off with the fact that the card was recovered in Nichols' living room and had three of his fingerprints on it, listed on the back of that card was the secret PIN number. Moreover, each time that the card was, quote, recharged, a money order was used, various witnesses identified the handwriting on all but one of those money orders as belonging to Terry Nichols. Jennifer McVeigh identified the handwriting on that last money order as belonging to her brother. Each time McVeigh or Nichols was proven to be on a call made by the card to their known acquaintances, take McVeigh's sister and father, for example, the more likely they also used the same card at or near the same times from the same originating number to solicit the various companies for the bomb-making materials needed to carry out the plan. In all, 604 total calls were made using that calling card. We'll call it the Spotlight card or the Bridges card. The prosecution called one single witness to tie all this stuff together. Frederick Dexter grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania and has a math degree from Elizabethtown College. He is stationed in Washington, D.C., where he works as a data processor for the FBI. His job in this case was to synthesize millions of phone records, connecting dots from dozens of these predicate witnesses and deliver them in a digestible format for the jury. We'll start with a few of these calls. Not all of them, but we'll talk about a few of them. We'll start with three calls made on October the 1st of 1994 to illustrate how prosecutors put this together. The first was to a Brooklyn delicatessen, the second to a True Value hardware store in Kingman, Arizona, and the last was to Michael Fortier's house. You may recall that McVeigh's good friend growing up was Gregory Pfaff, and that he worked at a Brooklyn deli, and he remembered getting a call from McVeigh sometime in the fall of 94 when McVeigh asked him for debt cord. McVeigh and Nichols both worked at the True Value hardware store that that card called, and of course you'll recall Linda Fortier's testimony wherein she said that McVeigh frequently called Michael during this time frame. On October the 7th, as another example, calls originating from Kingman, Arizona using the calling card were made to VP Racing Fuel and Kugel Trucking. Remember Glenn Tipton from VP Racing, who was asked by someone he was, quote, 90% sure was McVeigh for some racing fuel? Well, the calling cards verified that call happened on race weekend for the NHRA on September the 30th of 1994. Records also confirmed the second call Tipton testified he received about a week later, jurors would recall, from the same calling card. Dexter also showed jurors that after the date of the sale by VP Racing for nitromethane, all of the calls on the card to various chemical companies, hobby shops, and any other place that might sell nitromethane stopped. Dexter identified other calls used to corroborate the testimony from previous witnesses. On October the 17th, 1994, at 8.58 p.m., a payphone outside a Pizza Hut in Harrington, Kansas, was used to call the ex-wife of Terry Nichols. That's Lana Padilla. On October the 23rd of 1994, at 4.41, the card was used at a payphone outside of a Bow Video in Junction City for a 10-minute call to William McVeigh in Pendleton, New York. That's Timothy McVeigh's father. Another call was made from the same place using the same card to Michael Fortier's number. On December the 18th of 1994, at 6.50 p.m., a call that originated from a speedway in Saginaw, Michigan, reached Kevin Nicholas. You'll recall Nicholas told jurors McVeigh called him for a ride after McVeigh wrecked his car. It was on the way home from the speedway that McVeigh eventually admitted that the Christmas presents were really blasting caps. Moving closer To the day of the bombing on April the 5th of 95, a call on the card originated from Kingman, Arizona to Ryder Truck Rental one way in Lake Havasu City. On April the 11th, two calls from Kingman, Arizona were made to Terry Nichols' residence. On the 14th of April, a 54-second call was made from J&K Bus Depot in Junction City, Kansas to Terry Nichols' number. That same day from that same number, the card called Elliott's Body Shop in Junction City 
the place that everybody remembers, rented the rider truck with the telltale axle to Robert Kling. On April 16th of 95, the card called Terry Nichols' residence from Harrington, Kansas. On April 17th, a number of calls were made from Junction City, three of which went to Terry Nichols' residence and one to a Bell Taxi Transport service. Other calls at the time were also made using the card from outside Junction City, originating instead from Kansas City Airport. One of those calls went to the Dreamland Motel in Junction City. The other went to Lana Padilla's house in Las Vegas. Did Tim McVeigh or Terry Nichols actually procure that card and really use it, or was there really a Daryl Bridges? Well, if there was, he didn't seem to mind that someone was using his card. Prosecutors called John Kane. He was the executive vice president for Amex, the telecommunications network that owned and operated the Spotlight Calling Card. He told jurors that no one ever called his company and complained that the card was lost or stolen or that the account was being used without permission between December of 93 and April of 95. A small point, but valuable to defeat an argument by the defense that someone stole the card and used it to facilitate collecting the instruments of this crime. Besides that, the card was never used after April 17, 1995, two days before the bombing. Calling card is, in my estimation, one of the most powerful pieces of evidence in the entire trial. Once discovered, the numbers the card called provided investigators with 604 different leads that eventually uncovered McVeigh's footsteps in the months and days leading up to the bombing. The card represented verifiable, objective connections, the corroborative tentacles of which connected Elliott's body shop to the Dreamland Motel to VP Racing Fuels and from the 40As to the Nichols to McVeigh's own home in New York. Besides developing leads prospectively, the card also allowed investigators to test the strength of the connections retrospectively. You'll recall one of the original links in the homicide chain that led to McVeigh came from Eric McGowan, the 19-year-old who worked at the Dreamland Motel on the outskirts of Junction City. He also testified about phone records originating from McVeigh's room. During his stay between April 14th and 17th, those records revealed four total calls, two of which were made using the calling card. Recall also that Lori Fortier, Kevin Nicholas, and Jennifer McVeigh all mentioned during their testimony that McVeigh told them at various times not to worry about their phone bills because he was using a calling card. Thus, the card strengthened the eyewitness identification of McVeigh at the Dreamland Motel, and the eyewitness identification of McVeigh at the Dreamland Motel strengthened the theory that he used the card. These facts, in other words, converge reciprocally, strengthening each other, ultimately pointing to the same conclusion. Timothy McVeigh was in room 25 of the Dreamland Motel in Junction City, Kansas, the weekend before the bombing, and while there, used the same card that had been used to procure bomb-making materials for the previous year. McVeigh and his conspirators were now tied together for jurors during the major preparatory events of the bombing, seeking and procuring significant amounts of certain explosives, storing them, and ultimately delivering them. The tedious connective process culminated in Frederick Dexter, Small seeds of information suddenly sprang into powerful trees of proof. Here's what that forest looked like according to prosecutors thus far in the trial. On April 14, 1995, at about 9 a.m., McVeigh came to Junction City Firestone Service Station because he was having trouble with his car. He complained of overheating and white smoke coming out of the tailpipe. He filled out the sales ticket using the name Tim McVeigh and listed the address 3616 Van Dyke, Decker, Michigan. After inspecting the car, a Firestone employee named Kelly Osborne gave McVeigh an estimate of $700-$800 to fix the blown head gasket or cracked cylinder. McVeigh responded that he didn't have that kind of money. The Firestone manager named Tom Manning offered to sell him a 1977 Mercury Marquis instead of making that expensive fix. They took it for a test drive and McVeigh agreed to give Manning $300 and the car with the blown head gasket for the Mercury. But before he gave the Car to McVeigh, Manning did a roadworthiness test, fixed a tire, checked the battery, and put some transmission fluid in it. Meanwhile, McVeigh quickly used the calling card at a nearby payphone to call Terry Nichols for 54 seconds. Records indicated a second call, this one lasting seven minutes, was then made to Elliott's body shop. They were the only calls by any Spotlight calling card made at that payphone, and no other customer of Spotlight ever called Ryder. McVeigh came back and Once Tom completed the roadworthiness test, they filled out a bill of sale for the car, 
That bill of sale included McVeigh's signature and the familiar address in Decker, Michigan, 3616 Van Dyke. McVeigh handed him $300 and said he'd hoped he had enough money to get back to Michigan. Manning decided to give him $50 back. Quote, I just wanted to do a good gesture to help him out. End quote. At about 10.30 a.m. on April 14, 1995, McVeigh drove off in the marquee. Manning identified McVeigh based on this interaction and the fact that McVeigh was a former customer. Records show that McVeigh actually began going to Tom Manning's place in September of 1989 while in the Army. He was buying tires and otherwise using the station to service his various cars. Though Manning didn't realize it when he first came in. McVeigh remembered him, though. And on the day he bought the marquee, Manning said McVeigh removed his hoodie and reintroduced himself. I'm Tim McVeigh. <laughs> now, of course, tying McVeigh to Tom Manning wasn't difficult. After all, McVeigh was arrested in that very car by Trooper Hanger, saying he bought it from a guy named Tom in Junction City. The value of this whole connection, however, isn't necessarily to the car. The value is that it continues to tie McVeigh to Junction City near the time the only traceable vestige of the bomb was acquired, the Ryder truck. A day later, on April 15th at 9 a.m., a customer walked into Eldon Elliott's shop telling him he got a quote from Vicky yesterday and he was there to pay his reservation fee for the 20-foot Ryder truck. That customer gave the name Bob Kling, matching the name listed on the driver's license he presented. Mr. Kling made arrangements to pick up the Ryder truck two days later on April 17th at 4 p.m. Later that same day, on April 15th, a Robert Kling ordered Mugu Gai Pan Sliced Chicken from Hunam Palace in Junction City. The meal was to be delivered to room 25 at the Dreamland Motel. Phone records confirm that the call to the restaurant was indeed made from room 25, the room registered to Tim McVeigh. Marifay Nichols lives in Harrington, Kansas with her husband Terry, and on Easter Sunday, April 16, 1995, at around 3.30 in the afternoon, her phone rang. Her husband, Terry Nichols, had a conversation with the caller, leaving almost immediately thereafter in his old blue pickup with a camper on the back. He didn't tell her where he was going. She didn't see him again until 10 o'clock the next morning, Monday, April 17th. But when Terry Nichols got back, he took his son to the Kansas City International Airport so that his son could catch a flight to go visit his mother, Lana Padilla. Phone records indicated that there were two calls that day made by the Spotlight card originating from that airport. One was to Lana Padilla and the second to the Dreamland Motel, room number 25. The Spotlight card also made two calls from a Junction City payphone on April 17th. The first was to a taxi cab company called Bell Taxi Service. As a result of that first call, a taxi was dispatched to pick up a passenger, single passenger, and take him to a McDonald's nearby. The locals refer to it as McDonald's South, and at 3.57 on the 17th, the surveillance cameras inside, they captured a man leaving carrying a McDonald's pie in his hand. The restaurant's manager identified that man as Timothy McVeigh. That McDonald's is off I-70 in Junction City, and, well, it's just down the street from Elliott's Body Shop. How far? According to FBI agent Edwards, approximately an 18-and-a-half-minute walk. And sure enough, at about 4.15 p.m., the man claiming to be Robert Kling walked into Elliott's Body Shop to pick up his rider truck, giving Vicki Beamer his driver's license. She did what she always did and verified that the man in the picture on the license was the man standing in front of her. She then copied the contact information listed on the license into her database and her records. Robert D. Kling, 428 Maple Drive, Redfield, South Dakota. She didn't know it at the time, but investigators eventually found out. There's no such place in South Dakota. Lori Fortier and Frederick Dexter are similar witnesses in that both tied up one important segment of the trial while setting the foundation for the next. You'll remember that jurors heard from Lori about Bob's robbery, the quarry burglary, solicitations of chemical companies at racetracks, and a fake driver's license she made for McVeigh using the alias Robert Kling. Prosecutors followed that up by putting forth witnesses separate from Lori that backed up her claims. The term is corroboration. The strength of the corroborating evidence during that phase of the trial emanated from the varied and different sources, eyewitnesses, fingerprinted receipts, forensically analyzed drill bits and locks, and the various pieces of physical evidence collected from Terry Nichols' house, including its biggest prize, the Spotlight Calling Card. The means of committing a crime are defined as physical objects and substances, mechanical aids and devices of various kinds, known to be adapted or purposely contrived for attaining the criminal end in view. 
Examples of the means of a crime include obtaining a weapon like a gun or a knife or obtaining the component parts of the weapon like noxious chemicals, bullets, or, as in this case, explosive materials. At some point during the life of a crime, a killer decided that he needed to choose the right instrument to succeed in causing the desired criminal effect. The same goes for choosing an accomplice. In order to succeed, he needed to choose the right person that would help him attain the criminal end in view. Perhaps he needs someone to do the work for him and to avoid an obvious light of suspicion, as when a husband wants to kill his wife or a suspected criminal wants to kill his accuser. It may be because he lacks the knowledge or courage to commit the crime, and perhaps he's underestimated his target. Maybe some intervening circumstance has arisen and his goal has been frustrated. Or perhaps he needs help in obtaining the weapon or ingredients to make it. Whatever the impetus may be, an accomplice presents a means to a murderous end in the same way the gun, knife, or poison does. Now, The decision to involve an accomplice comes with a significant risk different than the risk associated with selecting and obtaining a weapon. Guns and knives can't remember and don't talk. Accomplices can, and they do. The killer betrays his murderous intention the instant in time he approaches the accomplice with the plan. Index anime sermo. Speech is the index of the mind. Should the accomplice say no and the criminal go forward with the plan anyway, the criminal has created a potentially devastating, incriminating witness against him. If the criminal does successfully recruit the accomplice, it's possible the accomplice won't follow through with the plan, again creating potentially devastating, incriminating evidence. Finally, even if the crime is successfully accomplished, the disastrous consequence of an accomplice eventually being caught and disclosing the conspiracy permanently exists. Trials since the beginning of time have shown that the threat of criminal prosecution is a powerful trigger for betrayal. Jurors must therefore believe that the accomplice is someone that the principal would trust with this type of proposal. That trust could originate from a close relationship of some type, as when gang members, lovers, or close friends unite to commit a crime. The trust could also originate from a relationship developed solely from the conspiracy to commit the crime, as when a hitman is hired. Alongside all this, it's important to remember that the right against self-incrimination means a witness or an accomplice doesn't have to testify if they choose not to. We've mentioned the concept of immunity in our discussions of Lori Fortier and Jennifer McVeigh. For their testimony, both were forced to testify because immunity effectively canceled their privilege against self-incrimination. What if, however, the government is unwilling to offer immunity, but they still want the accomplice to testify? They must somehow convince the accomplice to do so. The government can entice the accomplice, not with immunity, but with exposure to a lesser charge or a lighter sentence. If the accomplice declines to accept the deal, he runs the risk of being tried separately and receiving the same or harsher sentence. On the other hand, if the deal they offer isn't good enough, the prosecution runs the risk of having to try the case at a later time, and there are no guarantees at trial. The bargaining positions of the prosecution on the one side and the accomplice on the other, therefore, reflect the respective confidence each has in their own case. And that respective level of confidence shapes and eventually induces the accomplice and the government to strike a deal to testify. And that means that the accomplice is inherently biased. Prosecutors must therefore convince jurors that the accomplice was involved in the crime with evidence separate from and in addition to the accomplice's own admitted involvement, just as the affixing of proof against the person on trial entails proving the accused had the opportunity, the motive, and the means to commit the crime, affixing proof against the accomplice entails proving the accomplice had the opportunity, the motive, and the means to engage at least in the conspiracy, if not in the crime as well. because he could take us inside uh, Tim McVeigh's mind like no other witness could. Enter accomplice Michael Fortier. Before he actually hit the witness stand, the prosecution independently built a case against him alongside the one they were building against McVeigh. The spotlight calling card connected Michael to a plethora of calls made to key phone numbers at times and from key locations where bomb-making components were procured. Jurors already knew that he and McVeigh were friends while they served together in the Army, and they lived together at various points in their lives, including in the months immediately preceding the bombing. You also may recall Jennifer McVeigh telling jurors that her brother Timothy wrote in a letter that Michael was on a short list of people she could trust, a network of friends. 
Lori Fortier told jurors that her husband, Michael, possessed and expressed the same anti-government sentiment as Timothy McVeigh and agreed to help fundraise the mission by fencing stolen guns. Two weeks into the trial and against this backdrop, Joe Hartzler stood up and announced, the government calls Michael Fortier. Michael Fortier was born in Maine and lived there until he was seven. He lived most of his life, however, in Kingman, Arizona. In 1987, he joined the United States Army and was sent to Fort Benning, Georgia, for basic training. That's where he met and became good friends with Timothy McVeigh. When he got out of the Army, Fortier moved back to Kingman. A few years later, McVeigh came to Arizona from Michigan because he and their mutual friend Terry Nichols were on the way to Waco to protest the way the Branch Davidians were being held captive by the federal government. McVeigh had some souvenirs with him on this trip, including a, an ATF hat adorned with fake bullet holes. When the compound was burned down, the three of them, Nicholas, McVeigh, and Fortier, concluded that the federal government killed the Branch Davidians. Maybe they didn't start the fire, McVeigh told Michael, but they started the whole standoff. A little while later, McVeigh and Fortier crossed paths at a gun show. This time, McVeigh had a tape called Waco, the Big Lie. Michael explained to jurors that the two watched it, reaffirming their conclusion that the people had been murdered, that there was a cover-up, and that the government should be held accountable. McVeigh was convinced that Waco signaled that the U.S. government had declared war on the American people and that it was actively taking their rights away. Their fears of an American takeover stoked by the fires in Waco grew, according to Michael. They came to believe that an elite group within the United Nations were trying to disarm the American public so they could form a single government called the New World Order and take over the world. Fortier told jurors that he, McVeigh, and Nichols shared, exchanged, and subscribed to literature that supported all these beliefs. Fortier explained that one of them was called the Spotlight News Magazine, all the news that the mainstream media wouldn't print. Another was called the Patriot Report, a different periodical also steeped in concern of the New World Order. Fortier continued and told jurors that at the beginning of 1994, McVeigh called him and said he wanted to get out of Michigan. Fortier offered to help McVeigh get a job with him in Kingman at the True Value Hardware Store. McVeigh came and lived with them for a few days before getting a cinder block house in a town called Golden Valley, about five miles outside of Kingman. Fortier told jurors the same story that Lori told about the three of them setting off a pipe bomb in a valley near their house in September of 94. McVeigh, according to Michael Fortier, put the bomb against a boulder, lit the fuse, and ran behind some other boulders. It exploded and rolled the boulder on its side, but it didn't break it. He also told jurors about how he and McVeigh broke into a National Guard armory, scouting around to see if there was any evidence of U.N. activity. They found a bunch of trucks, deuce and a half, according to Fortier, but not much in the way of U.N. involvement. When lights fell on them, he described, they hid under a Humvee. In the process, they found an axe, a shovel, and a pick, that they promptly stole. Fortier got married to Lori at the end of July of 1994 in Las Vegas. McVeigh was the best man. Once they came back from their honeymoon, McVeigh moved out, and Fortier didn't hear from him for a while until he received a letter. According to Michael Fortier, McVeigh wrote that he and Terry Nichols had decided to take some type of positive offensive action, and he wanted to know if Fortier would help. McVeigh told him in the letter to keep it a secret from his wife, and Fortier responded eventually that he wasn't going to do that. Although he was curious about the plan, he wasn't going to keep any secrets from his wife. When McVeigh came to Kingman a few days later, they talked about all that, and as they stood by the fence in Michael's front yard, Fortier finally told McVeigh he wasn't going to help unless the New World Order tanks were in my front yard, he explained. Until they were at war, Fortier was unwilling to do what his friend asked to blow up a building. A few days later, McVeigh came to Fortier's house and told him that he had to show him something. He took him to a storage shed in Kingman. In it, McVeigh showed him 12 boxes of explosives that he says he and Terry got by drilling out the lock to some sheds at a rock quarry in Kansas. Fortier went on to explain that McVeigh also told him he figured out how to make a bomb out of a truck. He explained that he would drill a hole in the cab and run a cannon fuse through it into the cargo area and would use some of the sausage explosives from the quarry to aid the blast. He showed him how he planned to arrange the 55-gallon barrels of ammonium nitrate and racing fuel in a triangle in the truck's cargo bay and point it towards the building in line with the strongest direction of the blast. He and Nichols were in the process of buying the parts for the bomb using fake names, and one of the parts he needed was racing fuel. 
McVeigh explained he was going to dress like a biker to blend into the race track crowd to get it. Fortier told jurors that some time went by, and around Halloween of 94, Fortier estimates this time frame because that's when he bought his Jeep, that McVeigh told him he and Terry Nichols chose a building and that the building was in Oklahoma City. It was the federal building where the order for the murder in Waco came from. He was going to set off the bomb at 11 a.m. because that's when people would be getting ready for lunch. He compared those people, the civilians in the building, to the stormtroopers in the movie Star Wars. They may be individually innocent, according to what McVeigh told Fortier, but because they were part of the evil empire, they were guilty by association. Finally, McVeigh told Fortier that the date for the bombing would be on April the 19th, 1995, the anniversary of Waco. Fortier didn't hear from McVeigh after that until he got a call from him. McVeigh told him it was a code red. McVeigh explained that Nichols robbed a man named Bob in Arkansas who dealt in guns. McVeigh issued the code red to warn Fortier about any investigators that might come to Kingman looking for him, but the investigators never did come. The tale continues, and according to Michael, on December 15th of 94, a date Fortier remembered because it was right around his birthday, McVeigh called him and asked him if he wanted to make, quote, 10 to the power of 10. That's their code for $10,000. He told Fortier to bring some boxes, some wrapping paper, some scissors, and tape to a motel in Kingman where he was staying. He also wanted him to bring an M14. When he and his wife, Lori, got there, McVeigh traded Fortier the M14 stock for an M16 rifle, a trade far in excess of the worth in terms of value. But McVeigh was looking for more. He needed a ride to Kansas, and he wanted Fortier to go with him. The extra in the trade was to persuade Fortier to do it. The reason for the extra benefit was in McVeigh's duffel bag, a bunch of blasting caps he stole from the quarry in Kansas. And in the event that they got pulled over on the way to Kansas, McVeigh wanted to be able to tell the officers they were just Christmas presents. Fortier agreed, and Lori wrapped the blasting caps in the boxes with the wrapping paper, and the next day they left. If you've ever driven from Kingman, Arizona to Junction City, Kansas, you'd take I-40 east until it intersects with I-35 north in Oklahoma City. McVeigh and Fortier broke the trip into two parts, driving first from Kingman to Amarillo. Fortier told jurors that along the way on this first leg, McVeigh pointed out a few yellow rider trucks in the size he needed. They were the big kind, Fortier said, the ones listed at 18,000 pounds capacity on the side. They spent the night in Amarillo and left early the next morning. A few hours later, Timothy McVeigh and Michael Fortier entered Oklahoma City on a scouting mission. When they arrived, McVeigh detailed his plans. He showed Fortier the large federal building in downtown. Quote, it had a lot of glass in the front and a cement courtyard in the back, according to Fortier. McVeigh asked him if a big rider truck could fit into the delivery rain that they were looking at. Fortier thought that it could easily happen. McVeigh said he was going to either park and light the bomb and stay in the truck and shoot anyone if they tried to stop him, or he was going to have Terry Nichols drive down with him a few days earlier and drop off a getaway car. McVeigh pointed to a spot at the end of an alley for the rendezvous point. McVeigh would light the fuse, exit the truck, walk down the alley to the car, and get out of town. Fortier asked him why not just park in the alley. McVeigh told him he wanted to put a building in between him and the bomb as a buffer zone. That day, Timothy McVeigh left Oklahoma City just the way he found it. They headed north to Kansas, and when they crossed the border, they got off the highways to avoid using record-keeping tollways. They zigzagged their way to some storage units, one in Harrington and another in a town called Council Grove. They stopped at the sheds where McVeigh picked up the weapons previously stolen from Bob's. The two made it to Junction City and stayed the night. The next day, they went to the airport and rented a car. Fortier needed to get back to Kingman. For payment, they divided up the lot of guns, McVeigh giving Fortier the lesser valuable ones. Fortier was to take the guns and sell them on the gun show circuit. McVeigh told him to shave and carry himself as a military man because he could make more money that way. They ate at a pizza hut before going their separate ways. Some time went by, and 1994 turned into 1995. Fortier told jurors he ordered some documents from the back of a Soldier of Fortune magazine in order to make a fake ID and blank birth certificate. Fortier made the order using the name Tim Tuttle, a name he knew McVeigh frequently used as an alias. Fortier got a call from McVeigh, who was in town and wanted to see him. They met at a hotel. McVeigh said that Nichols backed out of the bombing plan. Fortier told McVeigh that he wasn't going to go through with it either. McVeigh became very angry because Fortier hadn't sold the guns like he promised and didn't have any of the money. McVeigh's bombing plan was deteriorating. 
Undaunted, McVeigh talked with him about some books, one of which was called The Rise of the Far-Right Extremists. McVeigh tried to persuade Fortier to change his mind and head out on the gun show circuit with him to help raise money for the plan. Fortier refused. It was a turning point in their friendship. McVeigh told him he was taking the high road while Fortier was down on the low road. McVeigh said, You're too domesticated. We can't be friends no longer. McVeigh left. They would never see each other again. Fortier stayed in Kingman. Though he lost his job at True Value, he made ends meet by selling things he found in the desert and collecting disability checks for a shoulder injury. On April the 18th, 1995, he and his neighbor Jim Rosencrantz stayed up all night playing video games. When they finished the next morning, they turned off the console and turned on the TV. That's when Fortier found out about the bombing. He told jurors he said to himself, oh my God, he did it. Two days later, he told jurors he saw on TV where they put McVeigh's sketch as John Doe number one. That's right when he got a knock on the door from the FBI. That's also right when Fortier's long track record of dishonesty with investigators began. Quote, Tim was like a buffer zone. If people thought he was guilty, then that would bring suspicion down on myself. If he was innocent, then surely I would have no knowledge of it, he explained to jurors. The agents asked whether Tim was capable of the bombing. I told investigators I didn't think Tim was capable. My answer was a lie. He also told jurors he lied to investigators about Terry Nichols. Quote, I just wanted to push him aside and not even have to think about him. I lied and denied any knowledge. Whenever they asked me questions about the bombing itself or any of my knowledge, I always lied about that. Take the trip to Kansas to get guns from Bob's robbery as an example. He lied by saying he hitchhiked to Kansas to buy weapons from Tim, but didn't know where they came from. He told jurors he was coming up with all these lies just off the cuff. He knew, though, that the agents were on to him. Quote, just the way they were looking at me and the way I was answering questions, it was all just really off, end quote. Did McVeigh commit the bombing? Answer, no. Had you ever been to Oklahoma City? Answer, no. But these were, according to Fortier, in front of the jury, lies. All lies. The questioning by agents went on for four days. Finally, according to Fortier, an FBI agent named Williams directly accused him, and according to Fortier's own testimony, truthfully accused him, mind you, of knowing more about the bombing than he was letting on. He called Fortier a baby killer, a charge that apparently really upset Fortier. He left the interview. The agents executed a search warrant on his house. They didn't just take evidence. The agents also put hidden microphones in his house and tapped his telephone. Fortier was recorded telling his brother that he was considering going on the talk show circuit and making some money. He was recorded telling his brother he found a career because he could, quote, tell a good fable. He told his friend Glenn Bringle that he thought he could make a cool million off the story. He was going to provide something juicy, something worthwhile to the Inquirer. He was going to write a story that Hollywood would pick up. He told his stories outside of the confines of his house, too. In a very famous televised interview on CNN, he told the whole world that he didn't believe Tim McVeigh was involved. He admitted to jurors he lied to everybody, his friends, his family, his parents, reporters, everyone. And besides lying, Fortier also admitted he got rid of physical evidence that might link him to the crime. He hid the tapes about Waco McVeigh gave him with his friend and neighbor Jim Rosencrantz. He stashed a bag of ammonium nitrate with Rosencrantz, too. He also fertilized his yard with some of the ammonium nitrate in an attempt to hide evidence in plain sight. He hid some of the explosives McVeigh had given him in the trunk of a car that his brother was building, too. Fortier told jurors that when he got subpoenaed to testify in front of the grand jury about the bombing, he was ready to come clean. He and his wife, Lori, came to Oklahoma City and rented a hotel room and arranged a meeting with FBI investigators. When they all met, Fortier got cold feet nearly as quickly as he started talking and wanted a lawyer. He got one, and when it came time for the talks to continue, they entered into a proffer agreement with investigators in which anything that he told investigators couldn't be used against him. Quote, I made a decision that it would be best for me to start cooperating, best for myself, best for my family, and best for the people of Oklahoma. He told jurors that's when he finally came clean. Fortier would eventually plead guilty to four cases. I'm in federal custody now, he explained to jurors. I pled guilty to four felony counts, conspiring to transport stolen weapons, transporting stolen weapons, making false statements to the FBI, and misprision of a felony. He was required by the terms of the plea agreement to turn over physical evidence of his involvement with the bombing plot, turned over the shovel, the pick, and the axe that he and McVeigh stole from underneath the Humvee, the National Guard Armory, the night they were trying to uncover proof that the New World Order was in the process of disarming Americans. He also turned over the explosives he once concealed in his brother's car. 
Fortier told jurors that the deal he struck with prosecutors meant a maximum of 23 years confinement. If he refused to subsequently testify at the grand jury or in trial, or made any false or misleading statements to investigators, the agreement would be void and the United States would have the right to prosecute Mr. Fortier for any and all offenses that could be charged against him in any district or in any state. Additionally, the way federal sentencing guidelines work, the prosecution could, if they chose to, recommend a downward departure resulting in a sentence potentially shorter than 23 years. But that recommendation wouldn't be made until after the trial, and that's how these things go. The defense must be told of the deal in place a witness is given so that they can expose to jurors a potential bias the witness may have in order to slant their testimony. Did Fortier have a reason to lie, a a reason to minimize his involvement and maximize McVeigh's? Well, even if he got 23 years, the maximum, according to the deal, and he sure was hoping for way less than that, he wouldn't die for his crimes, and as a younger man, he surely could live for decades as a free man. From the defense perspective, Fortier could be attacked in three major ways. First, the deal in place to secure Mr. Fortier's cooperation was hardly set in stone, and those variables would be exposed. 23 years possibly, but hoping for far less, and the final decision wouldn't be made until after jurors decided McVeigh's fate? What is the real deal? What is Fortier actually getting besides an opportunity to put all this behind him and live as a free man? Not only is he motivated to testify in order to avoid criminal liability, he was already proven a liar about the crime he was now telling jurors about. Thus became the second major avenue of the attack by the defense. He has the character, the wherewithal, the moral constitution to lie repeatedly and to whomever. And by his own admission, he lied to his friends, his family, the world at large through the press, and the formal venue of an interrogation room in the most famous case of his time. None of that stopped him from lying either. He was dishonest to the police, the investigators, and prosecutors, sticking to the false narrative for months. Would he stop? He was dishonest right up until he was given a plea deal and the death penalty was taken off the table. How could jurors possibly rely on the oath he took that day? Finally, and this was the last avenue of attack, it's a little more subtle, but a point that's never lost on jurors, is the deal fair? Jurors will always filter their verdict through the lens of their own personal sense of right versus wrong. The differences in the outcomes in a death penalty case are literally life and death. Is it fair that one man dies when others who helped him commit the crime do not? If not, would they give McVeigh a lesser sentence to even things out? And this is where prosecutors have to be careful in offering deals and where the defense can make great headway with jurors, especially in a death penalty case. Will the deal with the co-defendant offend the jurors' sense of justice and fairness to the extent that it will impact their verdict? The battle between defense lawyer and the co-defendant happens every day in courtrooms all across this country. Those three principles are at play each time. The technical rules for cross-examining an accomplice are fixed and universally applicable, much in the same way that notes in a musical scale are. But the cross-examination differs in the same way musicians do. How the lawyers weave together these principles, exposing bias, exploiting dishonest character, appealing to a juror's sense of fairness, is as varied as there are songs, symphonies, and composers. And after lunch on May the 12th, 1997, conductor Stephen Jones stood at the podium for cross-examination. Jones began exposing Fortier's derisive attitude and contemptuous mockery of the criminal justice system he put on full display for the FBI's recording microphones in his house. A few weeks after the horrific bombing, Fortier proclaimed to his friend Lonnie Hubbard that he was the key witness in the bombing trial like Cato Kalin was in the O.J. Simpson trial. He called himself the head honcho. He joked that when he was called to testify, he was going to pick his nose and flick it at the cameras or wipe it on the judge's desk. Jones pointed out that Fortier's life was heading nowhere fast. In the beginning of 1995, injured, unemployed, and and his tax refund was dwindling quickly. The story he could tell was his golden ticket. Jones pointed out that Fortier was recorded telling his brother that he couldn't wait to go on the talk show circuit either. Quote, I found my career because I can tell a fable. Those are Fortier's own words. Jones brought out that Fortier planned to write a book and make a movie after all these trials. I can make up something juicy. And the offers were rolling in. The worldwide media beat a path to Fortier's door. Dateline, 
Primetime News, ABC, CNN, NBC, CBS, The Inquirer. Fourier knew all about all those offers, according to the tape recordings in his own voice. Perhaps Fortier's testimony and appearance in court that day was all part of a, a much larger performance, a point Jones made when he pointed out that Fortier significantly changed his appearance for jurors. Short hair, clean shaven, no earring. The Michael Fortier the jury saw looked very different than the Michael Fortier who spent months lying to the FBI and gracing CNN's airwaves. Jones brought out a subject prosecutors did not. Fortier admitted that he smoked crystal meth on and off for eight years and that he hadn't gone more than a month without it. Question by Mr. Jones. How many times did you snort and smoke crystal meth all night and play video games like you did with Jim Rosencrantz? Answer. That would be extremely difficult for me to put a number on because it's so many, answered Fortier. And it wasn't just use either. I mean, he sold the stuff, all of which was going on during the period of time that he related to the jury he was spending with McVeigh. Did that affect his credibility? Did that affect his ability to recall facts accurately? Jones was hoping so. Jones walked Fortier through all the lies he told, not just to his friends and his family, but those he told in court on this very case, even after he said he decided to come clean for the people of Oklahoma. When Fortier entered his plea of guilty, he made a a written statement in open court denying any knowledge of the bombing. That was an obvious lie. Question by Mr. Jones. On August the 10th of 1995, you were in front of Chief Judge Russell in a courtroom just a thousand yards from where the Murrah building had once stood, and you were under oath to tell the truth, and in front of the same prosecutors now, some of the same FBI agents, you didn't tell them the whole truth, did you, Mr. Fortier? Answer, no. Even after he was put under oath supposedly admitting his guilt in court, Jones proved to jurors Fortier's lies didn't stop. Jones' next line of attack focused on the basis of Fortier's knowledge. The prosecution's theory was that Fortier knew so much about the details of the planning and the execution of the bombing because he actually participated in it right along with McVeigh and Nichols. Jones's theory, on the other hand, was that during the time Fortier was covering his tracks in the weeks following the bombing, he was also studying. Jones got Fortier to admit that he watched news accounts, bought Time magazine, read a bunch of newspapers. Detailed media coverage, of course, about this case was everywhere. Jones listed for jurors all the specific pieces of information Fortier was therefore exposed to. The government's theory about the use of a rider truck to deliver the bomb, that it was loaded with plastic barrels full of ammonium nitrate and racing fuel, that the name Robert Kling was used in Junction City to rent it, that ammonium nitrate was used in the bombing, that storage sheds were used to store components of the bomb, that a getaway car was parked near Murrah, that McVeigh was stopped about 70 miles away right after the bombing. Jones pointed out that the news stories abound about his old platoon mate, Terry Nichols, too. That Nichols was from Harrington, that Nichols' Decker, Michigan farm was raided, that he and McVeigh once scouted Oklahoma City. Fortier also admitted that the details about the quarry burglary were in the papers, too. All of these facts and many others accessible to anyone who wanted to learn them. Jones charged that Fortier did so adopting them as his own. The next line of questioning for Fortier focused on Bob's robbery in Arkansas, the so-called funding mission. I mean, if it wasn't already obvious to jurors, Jones pointed out that the story about the robbery being just a one-man job as described by Michael Fortier lacked common sense. I mean, Nichols acted alone with no help against an arms dealer in rural Arkansas, and the plan supposedly cooked up by him and McVeigh was to sell the stolen guns at the same places, the gun show circuit, that Bob was known to frequent? Does that make sense? Fortier tried to deflect these questions by saying that he used an alias at these gun shows. Jones was quick to point out, though, and pounce, well, how would an alias help if Bob walked up and saw his own guns, Mr. Fortier? The sheepish reply, it wouldn't. The crime was either wholly immature and ineffective in its design, Fortier's description was totally untrue, or he was still hiding something. Questioned by Jones, where did all those guns go after the robbery? Were they gone before the bombing? Gone before you were interrogated? Answer, no and no. Jurors were then reminded that some of the guns were in his brother's trunk, hidden, and others were with his drug-using, video-game-playing neighbor, Jim Rosencrantz. Fortier's deception went beyond merely lying. He also had the character and capacity to hide and conceal evidence he knew would link him to the bombing when he knew they were actively looking for it. Jones circled back to the famous CNN interview in which Fortier indignantly proclaimed McVeigh's innocence. Jones began with a simple question, Why'd you do that interview? Fortier answered that McVeigh was, quote, being hanged before there was even a trial. 
Fortier went on to tell jurors he gave the interviews because he felt he had to defend his friend and he got pressured into it by the media. Jones quickly reminded jurors that despite his need to defend his friend, Fortier offered to sell a picture of him to a media outlet for $50,000. Besides, by the time he gave the interview to CNN to protect his friend, he already told his other friends that he was ready to go on the talk show circuit where he expected to make millions. The FBI put too much pressure on him? CNN interview was in May, during the time he was supposedly spilling his guts to the FBI, and the case was already moving forward. In other words, Jones points out Fortier was telling the world one thing and the FBI another. Neither, according to Jones, could therefore be believed. According to Fortier, the occasion of testifying in front of the grand jury caused him to finally stop lying about his involvement in the case. Sure, he said he could lie to his father, to his mother, to his friends, and to the millions of Americans at home watching TV, and even to the FBI agents for hours on end. But, he said, he he just couldn't bring himself to lie to the grand jury because he had too much respect for him. At least that's what he said to jurors. Jones wasn't buying it. He reminded jurors through Fortier that before he was set to testify in front of the grand jury, he claimed he so genuinely respected in May, he only agreed to talk after he went to Oklahoma City and summoned two FBI agents and told him, I can give you Tim McVeigh, but I don't want to be prosecuted. Question by Mr. Jones. That would have solved all your problems, wouldn't it? No prison. You could go on your media tour, sell your books, make your million bucks, avoid prison, and get all the fame and money you would want. Fortier was trapped. He was either concerned about his friend, as he said to jurors, or about being famous, or about saving himself from being prosecuted. But it couldn't be all of them. Jones continued. What about those 168 people that died? Weren't you concerned for them? Fortier tried to wriggle free. I had a dual concern for what I should do. One, what is right, and the other for self-preservation. I just didn't want to go to jail. Jones concluded his cross-examination by asking Fortier about the proffer agreement. You'll recall that it was the formalized agreement between the government and Fortier wherein nothing Fortier told him could be used against him. Jones asks, who can that proffer agreement be used against, Mr. Fortier? Answer, whoever it implicates. It implicates you. Can it be used against you? Answer, no. What about Mr. McVeigh sitting right next to me? Yes. Kind of like the sword of Damocles hanging over your head, isn't it, Mr. Fortier? That 23-year sentence? Yes. And the string that holds the sword can be cut and the sword fall on your head if you lie? Theoretically, yes. I can't cut it, can I, Mr. Fortier? No. On the other hand, it can be caught, can't it? By Mr. Hartzler, Mr. Ryan, and the rest of the government of the United States over there. They can make the sentencing recommendation to the court, can't they? Yes. And they won't make their recommendation until they've evaluated your cooperation, correct? Yes. And it wouldn't be a sign of cooperation for you to say that Mr. McVeigh was innocent, would it? No, it would not, Fortier replied. But then he added defiantly, because that would be a lie. It's the defense's turn on our next episode of A Murderous Design, and they'll uncover for jurors a mystery about the case that remains unsolved to this day. They attack the integrity of the FBI lab and show jurors how one major finding on the only piece of physical evidence from the rider truck with any chemical residue couldn't be verified. Why? Well, it apparently just disappeared. Thank you for joining me. Visit AMurderousDesign.com for the script and explore the interactive trial visualization report by subject matter and by witness. I'm Brandon Birmingham. This is Timothy James McVeigh versus the USA. (laughs) 